One, two, three, four. Break through in my heart. Break through in my mind. Break through in my spirit. Break through in my soul. Break through in my weakness. Break through in my struggle. Come on, say You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough. Break through in my worship. Break through in my praise. Break through when I lift and glorify your name. Break through when I dance. Break through when I shout. You are the God. Sing it again. Oh, with the breakthrough in my mind. Break through in my mind. Break through in my spirit. Break through in my soul. Break through in my weakness. Break through in my struggle. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough when I worship. Break through when I pray. Break through when I live to glory. him like it's true come on he's not the God of the defeated he's not the God of the dead he's not the God of the almost he's not the God of the used to be he's the God that was and is and is to come if you believe he's the God of the breakthrough give him praise all over this house on Sunday morning praise him And I heard the Holy Ghost tell me over there, you're about to have a breakthrough in your money. Somebody's about to come into a financial breakthrough. I wish you would act like it was you and praise him for what is on the way to your house. Oh, glory. We got to preach, but reach over and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I need some room this morning. I need some room this morning. I don't just need room to move. I need room for what's on the way. Help! I feel something on the way. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm making room for my breakthrough. Ah! I'm making room for my healing. I'm making room for my deliverance. I'm making room for my breakthrough. I walked in broke, but I'm going out blessed. Somebody holler, yeah! I'm making room. Because there's a breaking in my favor. And there's a shifting in your direction. And somebody's walking up out of here different than the way you came in. If you came in sick, you ought to praise them, you're gonna leave healed. If you came in bound and depressed, you ought to praise them that you're gonna leave strong because the joy of the Lord I'm telling you, I feel this down in my feet. The joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you can you just give him a wave offering of worship 
Come on, can we just fill this next 10 seconds, 15 seconds up with your voice, with your voice, with your voice. Come on. I want you to lift your voice. That just turn the volume up on your worship for about 20 seconds right here. There's healing in the glory of the Lord. I give you permission to get lost right here for about 30 seconds and just sing a new song, sing a new song, sing a new song. You can play those cymbals and instruments. Come on. It's a song of worship to the King of glory. When I look back over my life, come on worshipers where you at. When I look back over my life and I see all the ways you made for me, I gotta throw my hands up and sing hallelujah. Come on. Throw your head back and get your shoulders up and sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Come on. Get on your microphone. Get on your microphone and let that sound of worship come up out of this house. Yeah. We worship you, Yahweh. Because there's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. Hallelujah. Woo. seven words for praise. I can't preach them all right now, but the one coming to my mind is one called Shabbat. And a Shabbat praise is a loud, piercing shout that is used not only to glorify God, but to serve notice on the adversary that the army of God is advancing. And I know not everybody in this place understands the power of a shout, but sometimes we people of God, we, we, we miss a moment, but I feel like this house just got pregnant with a miracle. I feel like it just got pregnant with a breakthrough. And I believe somebody's walls are getting ready to fall. But it's gonna fall when you lift up the shout of the Lord. I want you to open up your mouth and let out a Shabbat praise. Come on, Zion. Lift up a Shabbat praise. Yeah. Shout for your children. Shout for your house. Shout for your city. Shout for your breakthrough. Shout for your healing. Shout for deliverance. Shout for salvation. somebody right now somebody on the right side of your body I don't know if it's a tumor I'm not sure what's happening in the stomach area on the right side of your body but the Lord is healing someone right now in fact lupus is being healed as well right now in the presence of God in the presence of the Lord I feel a prophetic thing happening in this house 
I feel a healing glory. If you'll just step into this river, you can participate in the outpouring of heaven on earth. Yes, hallelujah. We thank you, God, right now that diabetes has to go and rheumatoid arthritis has to go. And Father, I thank you right now that in the name of Jesus, you are healing the back pain that is causing. Lord, and there are even those with migraine headaches that are being healed in the glory of Christ Jesus. The anointed one is here in his anointing. And I declare that every sickness is illegal. Every disease is trespassing. In the name of Christ, Almighty God, I command the people of God to be healed from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Stretch your hands up if you need healing and be healed now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Somebody put a worship on it. Somebody put worship on this moment. We worship you, God. you I've got a word and I'm so excited to get it out of my belly but I believe in the next two or three minutes something significant is going to happen because Christ Jesus is in this house This is a song that only is appropriate to sing to him. Just one more time. Every hand lifted, choir, help me. Come on, sing. watching she's probably sitting right beside them I hope they're on a beach under a hut but can you tell your pastor and first lady how much you love them and thank God for them as they're away resting come on I mean really give thanks to God that's what I'm asking you to do give thanks to God for the gift that he's given this house 
It is no secret how much I adore and love the Rayleigh family and the Calvary family. This is our extended family. He is a part of the oversight and leadership of what my hands have been tasked to do. I consider him a father to our generation, a mighty man of God. And Don Rayleigh can preach. It's crazy how much anointing is in this place. And this house is operating in such high levels of excellence even in their absence, which is why you know God has truly anointed the leadership of this house. So I thank God for this auspicious privilege to be with you today. It is a need and honor. My son was with me, my firstborn. Jeremiah, I'm so glad you came with dad. My firstborn, amen. <laughs> Two sons in the faith that I'm so proud of. Chris, my assistant and the director of security for our church. Josh Gazelman, who's been with me 12 years, 11 years as our youth pastor. Thank God for you brothers for coming all the way with me. I love you all. My eyes are upon the word today. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Pastor Josh, thank you for taking such good care of me, sir. You and Pastor Troy and I wish John could sing. I just, if you need some lessons, I'll see you after church. I'll take you to lunch. Isn't that ridiculous? Come on, thank God for these gifts, these anointings. I'm already sweating and hadn't even read, read my text yet, so this is going to get real, real wild today. I want you to go to Mark chapter 2, verse 1. For a few moments today, I want to preach from the second chapter of Mark, the first verse. When you got it, say word. And again, Jesus, and again, again, and again. Jesus entered Capernaum and after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, when they had gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. And they came to him bringing a paralytic, say paralytic, who was carried by four men, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where Jesus was. So when they had broken through, You are the Lord, you are the Lord of the breakthrough in my mind. Never mind, never mind. I, I, I thought that was a prophetic thing happening there. I'm, when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God? But immediately when Jesus perceived, come on, I need you to help me out right here. Inform your neighbor. He's reading your mind right now. Some of y'all just got convicted because you were up there talking and thinking about me and the Lord just fixed you right there. Come on, somebody. Come on, he's reading your mind. The Lord said, when he perceived in his spirit, they reasoned thus within themselves, uh, verse eight, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your, sons are, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say unto you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. 
immediately he took his bed, went out of the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God and left saying, we have never seen anything like this. That's how I feel like we're supposed to leave church right there. Saying, saying some crazy stuff like we have never seen anything. I've been in church all my life and I have never seen. But that's not my subject. My subject is found in the first verse. Throw your Bible down, lift your hands up and make this declaration. This is our sermon title. Throw your head up with your hands right now and open up your mouth and say, Jesus, you can have this house. I'm going to do it one more time so the enemy hears it. Say, Jesus, you can have this house. If you want him to have this house in your house and every house you live in, praise him all over this room right now one time. Help me, Lord, and bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I like to pay attention to the overlooked words of a text in the Word of God. Because when he wrote the text, not one word he put in it was wasted. And the text before us today is laden with so many layers of revelation it would be impossible to exhaust the totality of the revelation that exists in this text. But as I look at the first verse of Mark chapter 2, I immediately see that this is not the first time he has been in this city or the house. The text is very clear that he came again to Capernaum. There's a blessing in this revelation. Because if you want to understand the significance of him coming again, you must first understand what happened when he came before. In Mark chapter 1, we are told that Jesus goes to select his team. He begins to choose his disciples and apostles. He happens upon a man named Simon Peter. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 1 that this man Simon took Jesus to his house. Because at his house in Capernaum, Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Now you know Simon is for real saved because anybody who would love their mother-in-law enough to get them healed, you know they're right with God. I mean, he's for real saved. He brings Jesus to his house and he takes Christ into the room where the sick woman is laying and the Bible said he raised her up. And the fever left her immediately and she began to serve the people. When the healing transpired, immediately word began to shoot through that small community in Capernaum and people began to hear about Peter's mother-in-law receiving healing. And in that one evening, the entire city went up in a deliverance revival. All because one person got healed. I'm interested, I'm always just and sometimes amused by the strategies that we employ to bring people to the house of God. Most of the time our strategies to bring people to church are in some ways a cover up for the absence of the presence of the one who could do everything but if he don't come we got to work overtime to get people to come to church. Jesus had his own built-in marketing system. Without a television station or an advertising program, Jesus just started healing people who were messed up and the entire city heard about it and came to where he was. The Bible tells us that after he healed Peter's mother-in-law, that the entire city, you can go home and read it for devotion tonight in Mark 1, the entire city came to the door of Peter's house. Because I found out that when Jesus stops by the house, he alone will attract those who are looking for him. 
And the Bible said that he left and he went to a few other places to preach. He healed a leper and he let things settle down in Capernaum and he went back. That's where we pick up in the second chapter, the first verse. He went back to Capernaum, back to the house where he had raised Peter's mother-in-law and he's in that house again. And that blesses me. Because what it tells us this morning or this afternoon is that if God done it before, he'll come back to the same place to do it again. And I feel like I am assigned to address a stronghold that is floating throughout the kingdom and trying to attach itself to the minds of the saints. I want to rebuke the lie of the enemy that the best days of the church are somehow in the first chapter and that God can't do it again. I want to tell you, God is coming back to some places that have seen it before and he's going to move to spite the religious and to spite the enemy and he's going to reveal to you and me that he always saves the best for last and if he's ever moved before you ought to praise him that he's coming back to show you he knows how to do it again look at your neighbor tell him again I'm glad he don't just do it one time I'm glad he don't just heal one time. I'm glad he don't just send breakthrough and revival and awakening one time. I'm thankful for what I have read in all the history books, but if all I had was a reminder of what he's done and not an encouragement to believe him for more, I would leave this house depressed today. Can I tell you something? There is more of God hidden than has ever been revealed. Okay, let me rewind real quick. Revelation chapter four. We are now in heaven in Revelation four. And the Bible said that there were angels that circled the throne and they flew before him day and night crying, holy, holy, holy. Don't miss this. Is the Lord God almighty who was? That's history. Who is? That's presence. And who is to come? Wait a minute. How in the world can we get to heaven and there be more of him to come? there's a reason why eternity doesn't have an end it's, it doesn't have an end because if you ever put an end on eternity it could never be the vehicle through which the glory of God is manifested because anytime you put an end on it God is so much more than what went to the end he is beyond which is why eternity oh, it's why eternity has no end because we will need an unending time to see the revelation of his glory if heaven can't hold his glory then I know you don't think our two and a half hour service on Sunday can hold his glory come on inform your neighbor there is more of God on the way Come on, every time those angels went around the throne, every revolution around the throne produced a new revelation of who he was because he's the God of who was, is, and is to come. There is always more of him on the way. If you a seasoned saint, how many seasoned saints? And by that I mean 60 or older. Lift your hand. Come on, don't lie. You'll go to hell for lying. 60 and older. Can I encourage some of you seasoned saints in here that have been living for some time now and you think, wow, well, I wonder if it's ever going to be like it used to be. No, it ain't. You ready? It's going to get better. I need some praises in here. I don't even know who I'm looking for. I don't even know who I'm looking for, but I need to adjust the atmosphere real quick. I need some praises in here who believe that if he moved before, he will move again. The best is yet to come. God is not just a God of history. He is a God of destiny and more is in store. He came back to Capernaum again. He goes back to the same house. And when he comes back, his marketing system has worked because now the entire city has come to Peter's house. And there's something about this text that the Lord began to speak to me this morning. I, I want you to see it. It's there in verse 2. It's, it's there in verse 2. It's also there in verse 12. It's also there in verse 8. It's all, it's all through this story. It's the word immediate. There, there, 
there is something going on. I need you to see it. I'm not making it up. Four times in this one story, the word immediately is used. It's this idea of See, what I came to encourage you this morning, Calvary, is it's time to pick up the pace. Because when Jesus shows up in the house, there is some expediency about the purpose in his arrival. And with the kind of glory that is resting in this place, I came to tell you that the Holy Ghost is not dragging his feet. There are people in Ormond Beach and Daytona and Central Florida that in fact an entire nation that is waiting on a place immediately this is called acceleration there is a sense of purpose that, that, come on we are not in a position to be able to sit down twiddle our thumbs cross our legs and talk about the good old days something is happening People all the time, why can't you calm down? You're always so loud and sweating and hollering and running everywhere. Why can't you holler? I'm in an immediate, I'm, 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 I'm in an immediate mood. I'm, I feel like there's a push coming. God is up to something. I can't stop. Every time I try to sit down and rest, I feel the Holy Ghost pushing me immediately. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, don't treat me funny. Don't treat me funny. Don't look at me crazy. I'm on a mission and my steps have been ordered by the Lord. And I cannot sit here. I cannot sit by. I cannot just wait for the glory to pass. There's an acceleration going on in the kingdom. In fact, Pastor Josh would tell you, I texted him this morning and said, the Lord switched some things. I had given him an entirely different sermon and an entirely different text. I was struggling about preaching between this and Philippians 1 about the kingdom of God. I'm not going to preach it now because that ain't fair to you. But there is something going on right now. God is getting kingdom citizens in a place of kingdom alignment. That's why some of you have been feeling a little push from God. God is immediately, he's putting some things in position. There's some timing things that have been off in the kingdom. And God is lining some people up. And he's using apostolic voices to make a declaration that feel like a push. You just keep getting pushed. Why do you want me to go to the mall and stand on the corner and wait for somebody to walk by? It's because the kingdom is being advanced. And he's looking for somebody who will hurry up and get there and do what he's calling them. Immediately. Immediately. So they come to the house immediately. And when they get to the house, everybody's showing up. And that's one thing I need to, I think the Lord would have me to do. Just as a, a voice of someone who celebrates all of the anointing, the glory, the power, the breakthrough, the miracles that are in this place. The future that is in front of you. I feel like God would have me come by and tell you that you need to plan on the word getting out. Can you feel some people get real nervous right there? Like, what about me? What about my seat? I don't preach this at my place, so what about my seat? We might need it. In fact, I asked for about 300 people in my church who would be willing to stand. See, I can't get no help right here. I can't get no help right here. Because when Jesus shows up, you need to plan on word. Getting out in the city that something is happening down at Calvary. And I don't know where you think I'm supposed to be on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. But I know where I'm going to be. I'm going to put my clothes on and get to the house of the Lord. Because I heard Jesus was in the house. Here's the thing I need to say. When Jesus gets to the house, he is his own magnet. He is his own magnet. He starts drawing people. But you got to make sure you understand how he draws and who he draws. Because I think sometimes we think that when Jesus shows up to the house, we think the only people who come are the people who are ready for awakening. Hallelujah. 
But there are three kinds of people that come to church when Jesus shows up. Number one, the hurting. I need to make sure we all remember this is a hospital. Okay, okay, okay. I feel a little bit right there, so let me go out here a little further. It's a hospital. It's not a mausoleum for people who've arrived. It's a hospital for people broke, busted, and disgusted, tore up from the floor up, messed up from the chest up, and beat up from the feet up. This is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. And when Jesus shows up, you better be ready for hurting people who are so jacked up and crazy to come to your house because in most churches they can't find him and when he really does show up, they get there. Hurting people will come. I had somebody backslid. Tell me one time when we started moving downtown. You don't want to go down there. There ain't no money down there in the hood. I don't think I went after the money. I went after the harvest. I'm going to walk around in here on this second service. I feel like somebody in here is about to get a breakthrough. I feel like this house is about to get set on fire. There's been so much glory in this house. I've been watching you from Chattanooga and the accumulation of the glory and the residue of God's power is getting ready to shake an entire region. (laughs) Hurting people are coming. Not only are hurting people coming, hungry people are coming. Is anybody hungry this morning? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the buffet and the grilled fish and the asparagus and the cucumber that you're on your way to get after I get through feeding you this word. I'm talking about, is anybody hungry for more of God? Oh, Lord, if I had time to preach, I would preach about the glory of the Lord because sometimes in church, we come with no appetite. We come with no expectation. We come with so little anticipation. May I tell you that if you want more of God, the only thing holding you back is a decreased appetite. If you want him... All you got to do is hunger for him. He'll look throughout the earth and search the world for somebody who comes to church saying, I didn't come to see your suit. And I didn't come to smell your Estee Lauder. And I didn't come to show you my new weed. I came because I'm hungry. I woke up this morning. My feet hit the floor. I said, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to church hungry. I'm going to church hungry. Hungry for more. Hungry for more. Hungry for Jesus. I mean, come on, get out of the car twitching and shaking a little bit. And people come up and, how you doing? Pardon me, I'm sorry, I came hungry. Hungry, you know what I'm talking about when you come in and it's a slow song and you... You know what I'm talking about, hungry. When you get out of the car and you can't even hardly make it in here because you're so overwhelmed by the glory of the Lord. Did anybody come to church hungry? I'm telling you right now, I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. If you ever get a taste of God, it'll draw you back again. Did anybody come hungry this morning? The hurting are coming. Here's what I found out about God. God is attracted to certain kind of people. Now, he loves everybody, but he is attracted. Oh, you, you say, Pastor, do you have Bible? I certainly do. There are two places in the New Testament that describe the kind of person that God is looking for. Number one, the lost. Jesus, came, he, Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who were lost. The second thing he's looking for are worshipers. He told the woman at the well in John 4, the Father seeks those who will in spirit and in truth. That tells me two things. God is looking for lost people and God is looking for worshipers. And if the church don't have hurting lost people and hungry worshipers, it can't have God. God is not showing up with a bunch of people who don't think they need him or are tired of his glory. 
God is looking for a place, and I felt like I found one right here. God is looking for a place with hungry worshipers and hurting lost people. I'm going to sit down a minute. Hurting lost people attract Jesus. Jacked up. Messed up. They attract the Lord. And hungry worshipers. Where's that woman with the red hat on over there? She's going home with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, I looked at Jeremiah, I said, Lord, I'm gonna pray a hundred just lock her into our house. She got over here with her. Why is she doing that, preacher? She's just a little excited. No, she's not excited. She's tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And she came hungry. Hurting people come to a place where Jesus is. Hungry people come to a place where Jesus is. And hypocrites, oh God. Hypocrites come to a place. Jesus has a magnet for hypocrites. Religious people always come to check him out. The praise police. The breakthrough bureau of investigation. That's not God. That young person We had a 90-day revival about three years ago. And on one Sunday or one Monday night, we probably had 300, I'm not exaggerating, 300 teens and millennials dancing on the stage. And the next Sunday, that's right, praise God. I'd rather be dancing on the stage in the church than in the bar. That ain't good enough for some people. By the next Sunday, some real good preachers in the community decided to fillet us. All of that hoo-ha dancing going on down there at the Redemption Church. Bunch of young people with them earrings and tattoos and whatnot. (laughs) Somebody told me they were saying that. I didn't believe it, so they played the podcast. I got plum mad. You know what I did the next day? I got all 300 of them back up on the stage again. I said, hey, one more time. Let's run that demon of religion right out of this Oh, my God, did anybody come hungry with a worship? <laughs> Hypocrites show up to, to places where Jesus is. Well, I don't want to go to church. I know people right now sitting at home watching this by live stream. They're going, I don't want to go to church with hypocrites. Listen, you'd rather go to church with a hypocrite than to hell with a hypocrite. Trust me. Trust me. I'm telling you right now. You get here and shout right beside a hypocrite. Hallelujah. They may look at you and point their little skinny religious finger down their face and look at you and say, you're not in the spirit, you're in the flesh. Honey, shout all over their purse. I give you permission to slap the weave off their head while you wave your hands and give God glory. Don't let anybody keep you from praising the Lord. Only you know what he's done for you. Only you know how he's brought you through. You've got a right to praise him. I should have wore some overalls. I feel like working a little while today. Hallelujah! Jesus is in this house. Hungry people come in. Hurting people come in. And every now and then religious dry hides will come in. And I know places that tolerate religion 
Thank God I'm not standing in a place like that. I'm not, I've been in places that tolerate religion and they'd rather have religious people than hurting people. You gotta be real careful when religion builds a house. Because when religion builds a house, the atmosphere will be filled with religious mindsets and religious strongholds. And in this text before us, the house is full and Jesus is preaching to a bunch of people who don't even believe in him. Now some are hungry and do. Some are hurting and do. But the religious people didn't come hurting or hungry. They came to reason. And while he's preaching and getting ready to minister, they look at him. And they're just checking him out. And all that mess is in the atmosphere. Well, it doesn't really matter how I come to church, Pastor, and what I think, yeah, it matters. God is reading your mind while you're sitting here. You know that thought that's over in that corner getting ready to come to your mind? Here it comes, here it comes. Bam, you just thought that thought. He knew it when it was over in the corner. He starts reading their mind. And he, in listen, why in the world does he stay in a house with a bunch of religious people? A, do, why don't he kick them out? Or B, why don't he just leave? I'll tell you why he doesn't leave. Because he knows the hurting are on the way. And he's willing to deal with the religious while he's waiting on the hurting. He's willing to deal with the religious while he's waiting on the hurting. Oh my Lord, I'm fixing to bless myself if I don't bless anybody else because I've gone in enough revivals and preached in enough places and they look at you like, why are you here? And I want to say, I thought you called me to ask me to come preach and now you're treating me like I'm an imposter. Here, listen to me. There's a reason why preachers tolerate religious people. It's not because the atmosphere is supposed to be religious. It's because the man of God, the woman of God knows that the hurting are on the way. And when the hungry and the hurting get in the house, the hypocrite becomes irrelevant and the religion the religion doesn't have domination anymore I'm telling you you get a bunch of hungry people and the religious will pack their little bag up they'll grab their purse and bottle of water and run to the car because the glory of the Lord and I feel that kind of glory at Calvary on this Sunday morning I'm hurrying. Don't rush me. I'm hurrying. I'm, don't rush me. I'm hurrying. The battle of a preacher. He says, I'm going to preach. That's what he does. He preaches to all the people that are in the room knowing that the hurting are on the way. And sure enough, while he's preaching, commotion begins to stir outside as four men carry their stuck, paralyzed friend on a bed to the house where Jesus had come and they come to this house where Jesus is because they heard about Peter's mother-in-law who a few days earlier got healed of a fever and they started talking even though they were from another town they heard what was happening over in Capernaum and they started talking among themselves and said uh, we got to get Jim Bob to Jesus I don't know what his name was, but Jim Bob sounds good today. We got to get Jim Bob to Jesus. Where is he? He's down at that house he was at a few weeks ago when he healed Peter's mom-in-law. And we think if we can get Jim Bob down to Jesus, he'll do for this Jim Bob what he did for Peter's mother-in-law. See, here's the whole thing, family. Miracles in previous seasons are meant to encourage you to pursue God in the future. Anytime you look back over your life and see a previous miracle, it's always meant as an enticement to to elevate your faith and to project and launch your expectation into a posture of expectation and receptivity. He said, we gotta get Jim Bob to Jesus. So they all four 
pick Jim Bob up. Four plus one laying on the bed is five. Five's the number of grace. And anytime you're ready for a miracle, grace is always involved. Hallelujah. They pick Jim Bob up and they carry him and they're taking him to Peter's house. And they get to Peter's house with the hurting. And the hungry and the hypocrite are all around. And here's what the Bible says in Mark 2 verse 3. The door of Peter's house was so crowded that they could not get into the room. Here's the point. If Jesus is coming to this house and I know he's here, you got to make sure the doors stay open so that there's access to this glory. No, 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 wait, listen. I'm not just talking about physical doors. Sometimes we know where the door is and we know how to access what's happening in the house. But can you help somebody else access the glory? Let me say it like this. We know how to enter in. Come on, that's a 1980 white man dance. (laughs) We know what song to enter in on. We know what song to access the glory of the Lord on. But sometimes we make his presence inaccessible. And God is calling us. I preach this at my church. God is calling us to help someone else access God's glory. Well, I didn't come for nobody else. I came because I need the Lord myself. Listen, you 40 in the kingdom, 40 years now. At some point, the breakthrough you experience should become someone else's blessing and breakthrough. Oh, there's so much here. Here's the problem. The problem is we are producing, and I'm not talking, when I say we, I mean the church at large. So please don't take this person. I'm just speaking to the church at large. We produce sometimes a generation that lives from breakthrough to breakthrough. And you come, we, 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 we come to church on Sunday. I need a breakthrough. Wait a minute. You just got one six days ago. For real, y'all. Come on, let's be honest in here for a minute. You done managed to mess your life up that bad in six days? Come on, chains got broke off. Josh Carter was sweating. Jim Rayleigh and Don Rayleigh were passed out in the glory. I'm talking about he didn't have no voice. He had preached until the paint started flying off the wall. And you got a breakthrough. And by Tuesday, you managed to mess. Religion produces a generation that live from breakthrough from breakthrough and we have people who do not know how to sustain victory. Is that piano on? Can I use it? I don't know how to play it, but I got a revelation. What's your name, sir? How many love this brother right here? Come on, Amos. Is that a sustain pedal? Okay, turn this up real loud. Turn it up real loud. Okay? Here's what some people's breakthrough feels like on Sunday. Ready? I'm talking about we get a breakthrough and by the time we get to the car in the parking lot, we don't manage to lose the victory. Preachers sweating and hollering and falling out and people just sit... But when you get in a revival atmosphere and in a culture where the glory abides, this is what victory feels like. Where's C? Show me C. Is that C? C. You hear that? That's what it's like to live in the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord will sustain your victory. You don't have to live from breakthrough to breakthrough. You can get a breakthrough today and next Sunday walk into this house and still have your hallelujah and still have your victory. Slap somebody near you, tell a neighbor, it's time for a breakthrough. Let me get through. 
Some of y'all are enduring this for me. Thank you. Listen. He, he has a crowd of hungry, hurting people. And there's a few hypocrites in the midst. And nobody can access. But what we're finding in this generation is a hunger that will not be denied. So if your religious systems and structures are going to keep hurting people out, they're going to find another way in. So if you won't let us through your door, Mr. Church man, we'll go up on the roof. And we will tear off a lid. See, you ought to be thankful on this Sunday that you're in a house that is a covering. There is a difference between a covering and a lid. Oh my God, I don't... Uh, a covering will pull out the greatness God put in you. A lid will be too nervous about your success and will always try to keep you pressed down. You ought to thank God for Pastor Jim and Don Rayleigh who are a covering trying to pull the purpose out rather than a lid trying to keep the purpose hidden. We're dealing with a generation now they're sick and tired of a bunch of hierarchical hoo-ha. A bunch of nonsense. A bunch of rubbish in the house of the Lord. I'm a bishop. You got six people, sir. And you a bishop of what? I am an apostle. I do, I, oh God, let me get it off my chest up here in Florida. Nobody knows me down here, so I can say what I want to say. We got a dude back near where I come from. Apostle so-and-so. 12 people in his church, and he's got a security team. And he brought six of them to church with him. Six of them are his family. And he's talking about going around handing out cards, I'm an apostle. This generation is fed up with that nonsense. They don't care what your title is. They want to know something. Do you know where he is? Can you help me find the Lord? I'm not interested in your bishopric and your long robe and your little stuff. I'm catch cute. I'm glad you got it. But I'm just hurting. And I heard that the man who healed Peter's mother-in-law was in this house. Can you let me in? Well, no, sir. We cannot let you in. We're not willing to give up our seat. Okay, I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to go up on the roof and I'm going to tear the lid off this thing because if he's in the house, I didn't come this far for denial. I came to find the Lord. Did anybody come in here today and say, excuse me, if you don't want to help me find him, I'll walk up on top of this thing. I'll tear the lid off this thing. I'll do it until I find the Lord. And they dropped, they dropped, watch, don't miss, they tore the lid off and they dropped him through a hole and gravity let him down. I call it the gravity of grace. Grace will drop you down into the midst of a God that we're not worthy to approach, but we can come in because grace Come on in here, somebody. I told you grace was the one getting the man to Jesus and grace will not quit until you're standing in the presence of the one who can do something about your problem. I'm through with this. They lay him on his bed, drop him through the lid, and he comes down in the presence of the Lord. And the first thing he does is not heal his body. The first thing he does is not forgive his sins. The first thing he does is correct his identity. When they drop him down and he falls into the midst of Christ through the gravity of grace, he looks at the man laying on the bed, does Jesus, and says, with one word, smashes an entire lifetime of confusion. He looks at him and says, son. Son. 
When did he become his son and when did Jesus become his daddy? See, what the, listen, what the disciples and the hungry and the hurting and the hypocrite miss is that when you have a desire for him, when you're hungry for him, when you come into his presence, you can have lived a life of confusion your whole life, but one moment in the presence of the king will reveal who you've always supposed to be. You were never supposed to be a drug addict. You were never supposed to be a prostitute. You may have done that, but that's not who you are. If you're a man, you're supposed to be his son. And if you're a woman, you are his daughter. There's a woman in here right now. There's a woman in here right now. I didn't plan on saying it. But you're sitting in this room and you've been selling your body and you wonder, is that my identity? Is that my lot and my purpose in life? You hear me, dear sister. You hear me, sweet lady. I want to remind you of a story of a woman with an issue of blood. For, for her life, she spent 12 years of her life bleeding with an issue. She spent all her money and did not get better, but rather, rather grew worse. And one day she heard Jesus was passing through. She said to herself, she had lost all of her friends. She didn't even have anybody to talk to. So she started talking to herself. Self. She said, self, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. She presses through the crowd and she touches him. And when she touches him, virtue leaves him and gets into her. It's actually dunamis in the Greek. It's power. There is a touch that will extract the glory of God out of his very side into your life and you will never be the same. There is a hunger. There is a demand that you can put on the very glory of God that when you touch that glory, it leaves heaven and is deposited into your spirit. Oh, And you will never be the same again. When he stood up, he turned around and looked and said, who touched me? They said, Lord, all these people and you ask who touched you? He said, no. They just bumped into me but somebody really touched me and he finds this little woman she has been unclean and filthy she is not even supposed to be in public Pastor Troy yet she has broken the law to touch the Lord she touches him and when she touches him he says daughter she started off as a woman but when she touched him she became a daughter I'm getting ready to bless somebody in here right now. You might have walked in here feeling like a woman. You might have walked in here feeling like a messed up man. But if you'll touch him today and he'll touch you, I know he'll touch you. And when he touches you, the first thing he's going to deal with is not all your guilt, not all your, all your pain, and not all your mess ups. The first thing he's going to do is restore your identity. Son, daughter. Son, thy sins are forgiven you. Wait a minute. This man's laying on a bed. Do you think they dropped him down for some forgiveness, forgiveness of sin? No, but what good would it do if I healed his body but don't heal his soul? We got a lot of people running to healing lines wanting their migraines to leave, but they don't want their addictions to be broken. What good would it do for him to heal your migraine but not heal your sin sick soul? He looked at the man and said, son, he fixed his identity. Then he said, your sins are forgiven. And when he said that, the religious hypocrites. You ever heard them people? You can't even understand what they're saying. They just. <laughs> he said, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people say, who is this man think he is that blessed him? Who does this man think he is forgiving sins? What kind of blasphemy is this? Only God can forgive sin. And they missed the point. They should have had a praise party. 
Because if Jesus was in the house forgiving sins, they should have gotten in line because they had sinned themselves. Which is the problem with most religious people. They don't want to participate in anyone else's breakthrough because they don't understand they need one themselves. I came to fix somebody in here who think they've appointed themselves as a praise police and somehow the breakthrough bureau of investigation and you always the one that tell, I can see it, I can see it. I got people back up, I can see it when the Lord's doing it. I can see it when it's the flesh. You don't know what you're talking about. That woman you said was in the flesh and crying and wiping his feet with her hair. That woman is not in the flesh. She's just so thankful to be alive that when she finally found him, she wanted him to know how much she loved him. The religious people say, who does he think he is? Forgiving sins. They ought to got happy. When you see the Lord down here delivering somebody, get happy. Because if he's forgiving them, that means you could be next in line. Son, thy sins are forgiven. They start looking at him and he takes this moment. I promise you three minutes, I'm out of your way. I'm out of your hair, your weave, your extensions, whatever you brought with you. I'm getting out of the way. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And they start murmuring and he reads their mind. He said, which is easier for the son of man to do? To say thy sins are forgiven or to say take up thy bed and walk but so that you may know that the son of man has the power on earth to forgive sins. I said this and now let me do what everybody came to see me do he looked at the man and said I say unto you rise take up your bed and walk they lowered you down but you getting ready to run out oh, I came to tell you some of you got lowered into this house today somebody had to carry you into this house today somebody had to drag you into this house today you didn't even want to come to church today but I come to tell you that devil is a liar you got lowered in but you get ready to run out I need somebody to praise God that there is a rising up anointing in this house today Y'all stand, stay standing. I'm through. If you'll stay standing, I'll quit. Watch. Come on, stand with me. I'm through. He said, rise. Get up. Take up what was carrying you. Come on, let's be real. This man was a paralytic. That means he was stuck. Have you ever wanted to go somewhere? It's not that he didn't have legs. It's not that he didn't have the right apparatus. It's that... The apparatus, the legs he had, they would not function properly. Some of you got everything you need to do what God called you to do. It's just not functioning properly right now. And you're stuck. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you stuck? Are you stuck? Are you stuck? Now, I want you to talk to them because some of them haven't heard from anybody all day long. Look over at that neighbor looking like they're grabbing their stuff, getting ready to run to their car. They're getting nervous right now. I'm telling you why they're getting nervous. They're getting nervous because the anointing is starting to deal with them right now. The glory is starting to rest on them right now. There's some young people in this room right now. You're trying to get yourself together. You're acting like you're reading something. You don't even have any friends on Twitter. And you're sitting there acting like you're reading Twitter. You ain't reading Twitter. You're trying to ignore me, but I'm coming after you today. I'm coming after you today. God sent me to tell somebody you get ready to get up. I don't know how long you've been laying down. I don't know how long you've been stuck, but God's will is not for you to stay stuck the rest of your life. Slap your neighbor. Say, neighbor, are you stuck? <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Somebody said, praise the Lord, and you paralyzed. Somebody give God a dance. Somebody shout. Why can't I praise the Lord with freedom? Because you're stuck. You got the right apparatus. It's just not functioning properly. So what happens when you have the right apparatus but it's not functioning properly? You gotta have an anointing that breaks you through into a place of freedom. And there's some people sitting in here, you got feet that could be dancing, but you ain't danced in a while. You got hands that could be clapping, but you ain't clapped in a while. In fact, you got a voice that could lift up a shout, but you ain't shouted in a while. And it's all because you're... 
When I was growing up, we was broke. We were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. <laughs> we didn't have a Nintendo. We didn't have an Atari. We didn't have a Super Nintendo. We sure didn't have no Sega. You know what we had? Outdoors. We had the great outdoors, and we didn't even have enough money for a kickball. So we played a game called freeze tag. And when you the slow, chunky white boy in the hood, you're in trouble. So they start running after everybody, and this dude was so fast, and like, man, he's going to get me. And he tagged me, freeze, you're, you can't move. And he would tag me, and I was, I was stuck. And then a friend would come. Sometimes you got to get help. You got to have just a little bit of help to get free. So if you felt like you were slow and the enemy tagged you and froze you, if you felt like you've been stuck for a few weeks, if you felt like you've been stuck for a few years, my Lord, you might have been even been stuck for a few decades. I've got good news for you this morning. You might have been stuck, but your neighbor next to you has been anointed to help loose you. In fact, when we were playing freeze tag and they would tag us, we would freeze. And the only thing that would set us free is somebody would come up Somebody tell a neighbor, I came to loose you today. You've been stuck long enough, and the Lord sent me to help you know if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Yes, somebody praise God for freedom in this house right now. Touch your neighbor, say, Neighbor. Get up in the name of the Lord. Get up in the name of Jesus. You've been down too long. You've been depressed too long. You've been sick too long. I declare your breakthrough in the name of Jesus. I believe God is about to heal some people who are addicted and take the taste for something out of your mouth. Some of you have been stuck on a bed that's been carrying you all your life, but you're getting ready to come up out of that thing at Calvary this Sunday morning. This is a house where Jesus is. Somebody throw up your hands and say, Jesus, you can have this house. If you want this church to be an apostolic place of awakening and revival, if you want the presence of Jesus to just stay here in such a hot and very real way, I want you to lift up a 30 second praise right now to let heaven know, Jesus, you can have this house. Praise him like a generation's gonna get born again in the altars here. Praise him like cancers are going to dry up in this altar. Praise him if you want him to have this house. Now, how many want him to have this house? How many want him to have your house? How many would allow God to come in your living room and set your neighbor free right there in your house? You ready? I want you to holler out right now your address and I want you to tell Jesus, you can have my house. You can have my house. You can have my... Somebody praise him if you want him to have your house.
that is not the kind of praise that's gonna let him know he's welcome. Somebody praise him like your marriage is ready for it. Praise him like you want your children to know he's in the house. I rebuke a spirit of paralysis in the name of Christ. I rebuke a spirit of paralysis that has caused someone in this place to remain stuck. People have been carrying around a whole life, your whole life carrying you around. You're getting ready to run back to your house today. Here's what I found out. When you let Jesus have this house, people will go home to their house a very different way than the way they came in. If you're in this room right now and you feel stuck, I don't care if it's stuck in religion, stuck in depression, stuck in drugs, I almost said prescription drugs. I feel like somebody's dealing with that today. Whatever you're stuck in, nobody, there's no religious person going to do anything to harm your breakthrough today. You're in a house of hungry people who've come to participate in your breakthrough. Heads bowed, eyes closed real quick. Don't leave. Stay with me. If you're in this place and I preach to you today and you're stuck and you need to get up and you need to run home differently, lift your hand if I'm talking to you right now. If your hand is up or it should be, come to the altar quickly. Hurry, I just want to pray. Hurry, come. Don't wait. Don't wait. I don't care how long it's been and how many times you've been prayed over. Just come stand with me right now. Come stand with me right now. Line up in a straight line. That's right. My God. That's why God loves this house. That's why he loves this house. Holy Jesus. There's a breaking in my favor. There's a shifting in your direction. There's a breaking I need intercessors full of the Holy Ghost to stretch your hands toward the altar right now. Start praying in the Holy Ghost all over this place. Christopher, come help me. I want you to pray in the Holy Ghost because there's a breakthrough in this moment. Drug addiction is getting ready to break off some people's life. Drug addiction is getting ready to break off some people's life. Come on, we're not spectating. Just pray for a minute. Pray for a minute. The atmosphere is getting pregnant with power. God is filling this place and every life with his power. Lift your hands, young man. Arise. Take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. Jesus, Jesus. Just lift your hands. I'm not going to be able to prophesy to everybody. If God gives me a word, I will. I just want you to be receiving what God is doing. There's a breaking. Help me, John. I feel a breaking in your favor. Looser. Looser now. Looser. Looser. In the name of Jesus. 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 How? Oh, there's a breaking. There's a breaking. Jesus. Looser. 
arise. I bless you now to get up. I'm stuck anymore. Hallelujah. But you're getting up today, sweetie. Loose her. Loose her. In the name of Jesus. Loose her. In the name of Jesus. One split second, sir. That quick. Jesus. Loose. Ah, for the power of God. Somebody lift your hands in worship. In, in my direction. Somebody say there's a breaking. of God he calls you friend it's okay baby cause not only is he gonna touch that baby you're holding the first thing he did he just told me to correct the identity confusion inside he called he said tell her I call her daughter Oh, honey, it's okay. It's okay. She's under glory. It's okay, mama. Let, take it in. That's happening for your baby. In fact, generational mess is being broken off his life right now. It's okay, mama. Woo, shake him, bye-bye. Baby, you sit right there and take it. Your, your baby's fine. We got these sweet ladies around here and loving people. That baby's going to be fine. You get right there because when you get up, you will never be the same again. I declare it. Can we give that baby to that one of those sisters right there because the Lord's going to touch that precious mama. Lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder, please, because there's a grace of healing in the room right now. There's a grace of healing in the room right now, daughter, daughter, daughter. He knows your name. He knows your every thought. He sees each tear that falls And he hears you when you call Lucer, get up sister Carry your bed out this house today and go home delivered Gotcha, gotcha Now honey, just take it let him in. Just let him in. Just let him in. Touch it. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. Look at me. Look at me, sweetie. Yeah, you can. 
Take your hand off your eye. Look at me. I know. Uh huh. Listen to me. on you in the name of Jesus and I pray the grace of God be just poured out in your soul and that every chain and demonic yoke of addiction be broken off of this woman of God right now you're going to be listen you're going to be clothed and in your right mind Loose her now in the name of the Lord. Lord, first of all, I thank you for a place that a woman who feels this messed up could come and find you today. But I'm also grateful, God. You know what? What's your name? Tracy, were you raised in church? Okay. How old are you? So what if I told you you spent the first 50 year, years of your life not knowing who you were? But what if I told you God was going to spend let you spend the re rest of your life walking in a new identity that his grace was able to give you? Stretch your hands toward Tracy right now and confer a blessing on her out of your mouth and from your heart, please. Just pray for her. Would you come right here, sweet lady? Would you just lay your hands on Miss Tracy and pray with her? I can't pray for everybody, but God's doing something by the power of his spirit. Just one more minute of prayer. Would you stretch your hands toward this altar one more time? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. just a woman. You're a daughter. You're a daughter. Twas grace that taught. I want you to lift your hands up in a receiving position. Because I believe the Holy Spirit is getting ready to breathe life on you. And you're going to leave this place carrying what used to carry you. Free her now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, worshipers, can we worship the this old hymn? How precious is thy grace the hour I I need some real praises to throw up both hands and wave and sing praise God. Come on, sing. Praise God, praise God, praise God. 
one more time with your hands lifted come on if you're thankful for the amazing grace of God in your life we declare it praise God praise God praise God 